I make a run in my head every day. Every day when I wake up, I visualize me being in the race car. I visualize that tree coming down and hitting the gas and making a run and pulling the parachutes every single day. In order to become a better driver, you have to learn the parts and learn what is happening and watch the cars go down the track. The driver comes in on those split second decisions. That's where the driver comes in and that is how you're going to make your name out here. Today's <laughs> guest, we have Krista Baldwin. Welcome to the Eat Sleep Race Podcast. I'm Frankie Five, alongside with me is Hugo ESR. And today we're here at PRI, based out of Indiana, Indy. So, you know what? It's actually been a mild PRI. Usually when we come over here, it's been really cold. But, you know, no. I think... Uh, I'm in a hoodie. We've been wearing hoodies, so we're good. It's comfortable. So today's <laughs> guest, we have Krista Baldwin from McLeod, KBR. Thank you for having us in your... In your Office. booth. In the booth, yeah. This is pretty cool. Thanks, you guys, for coming. I mean, uh, PRI is always a huge show for us, and it's cool that, you know, I get to mix my 9-to-5 job with race cars. That's definitely <laughs> true. So real quick, Krista, I um, wanted to see, t like, tell everybody, like, how I met you a few years back at World Cup Finals. Um, yeah. Along with uh, your other coworker, ex-coworker, Hey, we'll, we'll name drop them. Joe, Joe. Macasero. Uh -huh. Yeah. Shout so. out to Joe. Shout out to Joe Tron. <laughs> <laughs> so we met you there. And then from, yeah. Really, from there on, it's probably been what? That was like six, seven years ago? I think so. Yeah, it was quite a was long, while ago. And you were still in an alcohol car. Yep, time. I was still at alcohol. Um, and then we started, you know, collaborating and growing the brands together. And, it's, and here we are. Here we are. Top fuel time. So, <laughs> Krista, give us a little background of yourself. Um, how long have you been racing for? Gosh, I've been racing for 12 years now, I, which is not a lot of time, I'm not going to lie, but it's, uh, I started when I was 18, uh, started with a front engine dragster, and then I graduated to the alcohol dragster, and then now I'm doing the top fuel time. So it's, it's, it's been quite the journey. Uh, I feel like 12 years definitely is not long enough. <laughs> I feel like I'm still an infant in this industry, but uh, I've been around it all my life, and just to be able to hit the gas, I'm super proud of. So that's driving-wise, 12 years. Um, I know there's a lot of history behind, like your name and also your your family's name. Like, mm -hmm. You guys have a lot of time in in racing. I would say mostly drag racing, right? Yes. So could you tell us a little bit about your your grandfather? Yeah, so I'm actually a third generation driver. Uh, my grandpa is Chris Karamasinas the Greek, uh, first to go 200 miles an hour in 1960. I mean, he was the precipice of breaking barriers, of like the foundation of drag racing is what my grandpa was all about. And then he continued to drive until he was 92. Wow. 92, you still go in top field dragster. Um, That's great. That's a long time. It's insane. Yeah, he, he drove over 70 years. Like, I can only imagine driving in 70 years, you know, like when I'm 92 and I'm... And he's been doing it. You know, it's crazy when you get older, you know, to, like, especially when you're driving on the road, the older you get, the slower you drive. <laughs> yes. But it has to be the opposite because you want to win, right? So you have yeah. to drive faster. No, so he, that's crazy. No, he kept driving. The actual top fuel car that I drive today is actually the car he drove. And so when he retired, I acquired the car. And I got my chance in it, and yeah, he is literally still going 300 miles an hour, and he was 92 years old. That's crazy. Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> yes. To, 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 to say the least. So give us a little rundown. Like, now that you started from the front engine, licensing-wise, that's all different licensing, right? Yes. Every car that you get into in the NHRA, you have to make an upgrade. So when I first started, I had to make six runs under a specific time on the French engine car when I was 18. Uh, did it with flying colors. And then when I wanted to make my upgrade to the injected nitro car, the top alcohol class, uh, that was three runs after, under a certain time. I had to go like 5.6 seconds at 240 miles an hour. Uh, did that. And then when I did the top fuel car, I had to go, gosh, I think something like a 4.2 seconds at 290 miles an hour. And I qualified with a 399. Wow. So, so how did it 
So how does qualifying work? Does that, is that something done during an event or is it done, you know, when there's not an event? Like who validates that you ran that time and, you know, how does that whole work when you want to qualify? Yeah, so we actually have to rent the track. So most of the time it's the Monday after a national event because everyone is still there. Track is still prepped. Uh, the safety safari is still there. Uh, and I actually have to have two other licensed drivers sign off on my license to vouch for, you. To vouch for me. So obviously my grandpa signed it and Paul Lidro uh, signed the other half of my license. So oh. it's pretty cool when you have to like go ask someone like, hey, do you mind watching me drive this insanely gnarly car and you sign off on it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So you're obviously, you're lucky enough to actually have access to these cars. Yes. Uh, when, when it comes to th th this class of racing, if you didn't have the cars, would you, and let's just say me, I'm off the street, I wanted to drive top fuel. Is that possible? It's definitely possible. I mean, uh, the biggest thing in our sport is the financial part of it. But for you to understand top fuel and for you to appreciate top fuel, you need to drive something slower and understand the fundamentals of drag racing, mm -hmm. where you're at on the track, what does, you know, the 60 foot time and what, how you stage the car and all those things, all those little things is really, sometimes it's tough. And you can tell when like a newbie is in the class and they have not raced at all because they yeah, mess up the fundamentals. To, even coming to staging. Exactly. Right? Staging is always, it's half mental and half physical. When you're staging that car, you have to be ready. You stage when you are ready. Yeah. And so a lot of the time people are just like, oh, I got to hurry rushed. up because they're going in. No, no. Yeah. You stage when you are ready because the second you hit that second bulb and that tree comes down, you literally have to drive by the seat of your pants and you have to understand what is happening behind you, specifically in the top field car because obviously right. the motor's behind me. But you have to understand what's happening there for you to figure out what's happening in front of you, for you to figure out where you're at on the track and stay in the groove and when to pedal it, when to not pedal it, to make split, like life or death situations. Not and you even, have to make a split it's decision. It's kind of hard to even say split second because it, it, the whole it, it, pass is it's what? It's only three, three seconds. seconds? <laughs> that's, so. not a, that's not enough time to think. No. My brain can't think in three <laughs> seconds of what I would need to do. You know, sometimes my brain, I wonder what happens in those three Something's seconds. Something's going on. Yeah. So, IQ levels of drag racers uh -huh. is definitely up there. It, it, Can't say that. You have to pay attention. Right. <laughs> so how, when you, when you drag, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, it's just, it's drag racing. It's simple. You just go straight in the line and, and you just step on the gas and you go. You obviously just explained that there's a lot involved in there. Like, yes. what do you do to prepare yourself for that? Like, for example, cutting a good light. Is there anything that you do? prior to, you know, actually when you're competing, things that you could do to help you with your reaction time? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the biggest things I do, so obviously I'm not on the full tour, but I go to most of the races with Paul's car. So whenever he's staging the car, I'm staging the car. And then I hit the gas usually when he hits the gas. So it's just seeing that repetitive, you know, light and seeing the flash and seeing the flicker and seeing, just seeing that yellow constantly and just knowing that your foot has to react the second you see the yellow but you also can you know i have a, a practice tree at home and i but the biggest thing that i always tell new drivers is i make a run in my head every day every day when i wake up i visualize me being in the race car i visualize that tree coming down and hitting the gas and making a run and pulling the parachutes every single day and just so you don't lose sight of it, but on the flip side of that, it just, when it amps you up in the morning, it's like a cup of coffee. <laughs> just thinking That's like of your driving. shot espresso, right? Yeah. Like just driving a nitro car is insane, but. Uh, so you get lot. that adrenaline rush every morning, basically, is what yeah. you're saying. Yeah, as long, like, I, like I'm just talking about it for what, the last two minutes, and I'm already like pumped the fuck up. Like, you know what I mean? Like, awesome. I am ready to go. That's awesome. <laughs> So when I first met you, you, obviously it was more McLeod. You're still with McLeod. Give us like the little balance of the work life. And the, <laughs> Is I, I there even, a balance? I don't, I don't even know. <laughs> because for you, you, you work for a company that is also very heavily involved in drag racing. Yes. It actually has its own drag racing team that yes. you're part of. So is it really work for you? 
Yes and no. There's some days where I'm like, man, this really sucks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, take me to the racetrack. But on the other days, I'm selling products that customers can put in their car, and I know they're going to work. And the second I put give, you know, whatever clutch or torque converter or whatever it may be, I know that they are going to be satisfied, and they're going to get that thrill of what I feel in the race car from their street car, from their drag car, from their pro mod, from their you know, super comp car, whatever it may be. But the, the balance between all of it is a little tough, I'm not gonna lie. So on one hand, I'm the director of marketing for Wharton Automotive Group, which is McLeod, Silver Sport Transmissions, FTI, uh, and now FTI Parts that we just debuted this morning at PRI. Uh, but on the flip side, I'm also the general manager for Paul Lee's team. And so I you make- You got three jobs. I, I, yes. Wow. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know that. <laughs> so I make sure that the truck and trailer go down the road. I make sure our hotels are good. I make sure we eat. I make sure that Paul's satisfied. I make sure that, you know, everything goes without a hitch. And believe me, there's some weekends where there's a lot of hitches. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. And but only you know them, though, most for the most part. I'm, I mean... You, you control everything. I try. That's awesome. <laughs> I try, and then, you know, just the, the balance between those two things. But then again, coming around the corner with my own team and being out there myself and being, you know, the only female top field team owner and driver in the sport, it's like it's that, that part of it also, it like, something. excites me. You know, like, I'm doing something that no one else in our sport is doing right now. Right. That's awesome. <laughs> By yourself. By myself. For the most part. <laughs> so Krista, is there, there's, there's the actual, you're a race car driver, you're a general manager, you work in McLeod, Wharton Group. Is there anything else that you do when you're not working, not drag racing in the sport? Do you do, do you have any other hobbies or is, is drag <laughs> racing life? Hobbies? <laughs> That's funny. You have to have time for hobbies. I hate to say it. <laughs> some do, some do. <laughs> no, drag racing is life. I mean, I like, eat, sleep, race. That is literally what I do. I do this all day because I want to be in that top field car so bad. I want that thrill. I want that excitement. I want that hustle. Like the hustle part of drag racing is also like a huge passion of mine because it also shows that you are committed to something. And like, I have a vision of what I want to be in five years and I'm not going to stop. That's awesome. great. So you have, you have a long-term goal that you're trying to achieve. Yes. Well, she's also fairly young, so there's, there's a long time of <laughs> yeah. racing I mean, that you Grandpa can do. did it for Grandpa seven years. Yeah, like that. I mean, <laughs> you got a long yeah. runway to go. Yeah. yeah. So let's just uh, give us a real quick breakdown of like a race weekend for you. Um, the the big thing that a lot of people want to feel like they want to know is it's like cost. People, it's always you always hear the rumors. Oh, in order for you to compete, you need. You know, you're spending 200 grand a weekend. You're spending 300 grand a weekend. God forbid this happens. Like, what is the ideal, like, how do you budget yourself for that? Like, like a basic, you know, I shouldn't even say basic, um, a, a race weekend for running a top field team. Uh, it's, it's tough to budget it. But, uh, so approximately it cost me eight to $10,000 a run to make a one run. And that's the, one run. That's one run. Wow. One mile. run. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I usually budget about thirty five to forty thousand a weekend. That's including, you know, hotels, paying my crew, feeding my crew, uh, feeding in parts that need to be fed in because we have a lot of consumables. I don't think a lot of people understand that. Like I can go through one rack like rods and pistons in one run and I would sometimes have to wholesale the whole thing and change out a whole rack. Wow. Normally, if it's a good run and the car is cooperative and, you know, everything works out, I usually have to feed in one or two pistons uh, just because it starts scuffing and it just, those are consumables. Yeah. It's hard to imagine that, like, a, a, aluminum rod is a consumable, yeah. <laughs> but it is. It, it honestly is. And between the oil and the nitro, nitro is crazy. It's like $55 a gallon and I wow. burn 15 gallons in one run. Ooh. One run. 15 gallons in 15 one run. 15 gallons in one so, I When I warm up, it's five gallons. I was going to say, like, like, does that include the warm up? No. Okay. So, <laughs> so every five run, gallons, five I'm doing like 20 gallons. That's crazy. How many? Oh, my. 20. 20 gallons minimum. Yeah. So yeah. with the with the nitro, and even, even the alcohol cars, like the fumes. Mm -hmm. I remember going to my first NHRA race back in Englishtown, and 
I was super excited to stand by John Force's car. And when they started it, I thought, I, I didn't even know what to expect. I, yeah. didn't, I, <laughs> couldn't, I, tearing, I couldn't I couldn't see. Yeah. I couldn't see. I couldn't hear. And I couldn't uh -huh. see. I felt like I was dying. Mm -hmm. I thought it was and, like and some gas. of these guys are just standing there like. Oh, we got some fans that are just like hardcore. And they literally stand there and they smell it. And they take it all in. And I'm so, like. like by Ooh. now, are you immune to that? Oh, God, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Because when you I started never seeing the immune. people like put the masks on us, mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, that's a serious mask. See, it's funny. It's funny that you bring that up. So, uh. I kick it old school. I, I like to do it the way that we've done it for the last 70 years. And so the way that we've done it is no mask. Really? <laughs> so I don't think I've ever warmed up a car with a mask. Even when I warmed up Paul's Nitro Funny Car, where the motor is in front of you, they're like, oh, you want to wear a mask? I'm like, no, I'm fine. Well, that was kind of a mistake because the motor is literally in front of you. <laughs> it's blowing all those fumes at you. But wow. it also, it's so funny because... Um, when I changed crews and crew chief over the last year, you know, they come from another car. And then they come up to me on the first warm up. They're like, where's our mask? I'm like, what? What mask? He doesn't wear what are, one. What you have are to bring you your talking own. about? Yeah. So the next race, -O -M. they brought their own mask. <laughs> B-Y-O-M. Bring your own mask. You they're work for like, Krista. Yeah. You're not going to have a mask. Yeah, that, mm, I they're mean, like, that's a note to cool. self. They're, they're like, damn. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I usually wear a mask. How am I going to? I'm going to get this car ready. Yeah. So, but it, it's funny. Just that's one of the things I love when we have new people come into the sport and like I'm showing them around or whatever it may be. And I'm like, oh, why don't you stand right, right here? here. I'll, uh, I'll be right, right back. I'll be right, right back. You know? <laughs> and I leave them there. You guys should, uh, we, we've been making the like little stickers mm -hmm. for the ground. So maybe that's what you should do for like, Ooh, when you yeah. have guests come in. Stand like, right here. Uh, this is for the viewing. Here's the X. Yes, X for viewing. <laughs> That'll be that'll be pretty. Um, speaking on the nitro, has nitro changed, like the formulas or anything like, like different additives between you know back then to now, or is it still pretty much the same? It's pretty much the same. So the one thing that nitro is unique is that it actually carries its own oxygen molecule. So what you are seeing when I hit the gas and the header flames come out is actually that combustion within the chamber is burning so much faster. One because you have a supercharger on it and has extra amount of boost on it. But it's also, the fuel is carrying its own oxygen molecule. So it's burning that much harder and that much faster for these cars to propel the way that they do. And now, also, the common number, what's the number, what's the horsepower number for top fuel drives? 11,000 horsepower. 11,000. 11,000. 11,000. And is it different <laughs> from that to a funny car? No, they're about the same. So between a nitro, uh, a top fuel car and a funny car, uh, the motor is actually the same. We actually use all the same internal parts. The only thing difference is the chassis. So, okay, good to know. That's that's very interesting. So, when it comes to your your favorite or the most, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Memorable time in drag racing. Do you have that one thing that sticks in your head when when it comes to the most memorable? I have a few. Um, but most recently, my most memorable run that I've made is we were at the World Finals last year in Pomona. Uh, I grew up in Pomona. My dad grew up in Pomona. And I came out with a throwback paint scheme of my dad's car. And it was awesome. All the fans came out with their Bobby Baldwin shirts on. All the old crew guys came out and they had their starting line shirts on. And I had them all up on the line like... It was like it just awesome. it, hit, like it hit you in the feels, you know, like all the things. And not to mention, my dad is actually in the sand trap. Like, that's where we put his ashes when he died. So, oh, like, wow. it's all Coming the things, wow. you know, right? So, we're getting ready. Uh, it's race day, it is championship Sunday. So, I am up against Mike Salinas. Mike Salinas, if he beat, if he would beat me, he would go on to possibly win the championship that day. Like it is down to like two or three runs and you're gonna name the champion. I'm like, okay, no pressure. I'm here at my home track, I'm gonna have fun. Like I, I that's the whole thing is like, you gotta have fun when you do this, right? So man, I just remember it's Sunday morning, I go out, I do driver intros, I walk across the stage, I wave to everyone. And then every, every Sunday after driver intros, I walk the track, I go up there, and I stand right where I'm gonna stage the car and I just visualize what I'm gonna see, how I'm gonna see it. And this is where the sun's hitting that day and make sure you're looking over here. This is where the groove is. Just 
you know, mentally preparing myself yep. to get into that space. Because like I said, racing the car is one thing. It's the men mental part is tough. Whatever, put my stuff on like normal, get in the car. Of course, there's an oil down in front of me. So now I'm sitting in the car for like an extra 10, 15 minutes. Hot. Hot. And it, like you're just going through that run and, and the over hardest and over, over and over again. And you have to keep your energy up. Yeah. So I have to dip my energy down a little bit because I know that I'm going to sit here for a second, but I'm, I'm still like shaking because I'm amped up so much. Yep. Okay, next pair, go down the track. Okay, here we go. This is it. I remember hitting the gas and not knowing because I can't really see anyone because in my canopy car, the vision, it's I don't like have a, a tunnel, lot of vision. Literally. It's literally a tunnel. So all I can see is in front of me. I hit the gas, car's going, it's moving pretty good. And then I felt... Uh, the car shut off because some like the pan pressure went off. So whenever uh, we have a, a sensor in our cars where if the pan pressure goes up, it'll shut the car off. Just to save parts and it just it just makes sense. Cautionary. Yep. So car shuts off about half track. Now I'm coasting and I'm still going. Like I would have. Yeah. Miles an hour. So I'm still like going pretty fast. Well, he smoke the tires at the hit i have no clue and i get past the the thousand foot mark i looked over and my wind light was on i'm like no what? fucking way <laughs> and i am jumping and i am this bumping and i'm like this is awesome you know and like i am amped up and it was just that was so so cool and i got to do it and like my dad was at the end of the track you know all the things right so Everything i round the up. corner mm -hmm. round the corner i get out of the car and Amanda Busick's like, Crystal Ball went over here for an interview. And like, I'm just jumping, right? And then everyone comes up from the starting line to come pick up the car. And I had to stay back for the, the interview. NHRA interview. So they all go, I'm crying. Like, I am bawling, right? <laughs> Get done with the interview. Uh, the NHRA guys gave me a ride back on the golf cart. The coolest fucking moment of my life. I make the turn to go in front of the grandstands. And everyone's cheering. Everyone everyone's... stood up and clapped. That's awesome. Like, it, it's literally giving me goosebumps. That's like, awesome. Like, my hometown crowd is up there supporting me. That's like, awesome. Like, that was the coolest moment that I've had so far. Like, the coolest, coolest moment. Yeah, I you mean. Had that on, I thought I saw that on your Instagram. Like, the you, had, you made a little video about that yeah. that day, right? So, yeah, I did. Yeah. I had a whole production done because I knew this was going to be a special weekend because I had my dad's tribute car and stuff yeah. like that. So, um, I reached out to a friend. Her name is Krista as well. And she, I said, look, I don't know what you're going to film, but I just want to remember this weekend. And then to have her film that part, too, was awesome awesome and then the same weekend nhra on fox they gave me a helmet visor i was the first person in top field drag studio to have a helmet visor camera right oh wow so you can now they you have see, footage from that yeah so you see me the yes. second i see the light turns on you see me pumping in the race car <laughs> it's so funny but every time i watch that video i go back to that moment and it's like that was such a surreal That's cool. surreal moment and i i honestly cannot wait to like have more have moments more yeah. yeah that's and everyone yeah. can see that on your instagram Yes, yes, if you guys go to don't my Instagram. Us, go check out Chris's Instagram and you can watch that video. Yes. So, from the time I met you to now, obviously, you, you've already been in two different classes. Uh, what's the future hold for you? Like, you know, this season's over, we have 2024 coming up. Like any, anything special or anything like that? Yeah, so this last season uh, was a little bit slower than I normally do. I only went to four races in a, a top fuel car, I went to two in an alcohol car. Um, but it's time for me to get a new car. It's, it's time. I've had this car. It's a Don Schumacher Racing Fab Shop 001 car, like the first car they ever made at DSR. Oh, I wow. have, you know, and that car went through Corey Mack. It went through Spencer Massey. Uh, it went through my grandpa and now it's going through me. And I, now that I'm pushing the envelope more and I am finding more funding, I can absolutely push the envelope more, means that I'm going to go faster. And I just don't think that car can take, you know, going a 370 pass. So I'm in the middle of getting a new car, Okay. something where I can be consistently in the 370s. Because if you're not running 379 or better, you might as well stay home. 
Really? The top field class is stout right now. It is so, so stout. I mean, I went down to Dallas and I drove Scott Palmer's car. I ran a 388. I was 20th. Wow. 20th. A 388. Yeah. <laughs> I was a 10th slower than the class. Yeah. Like, That's it, a big deal. It's insane. Yeah. So it just, uh, this winter, um, trying to bring all the might I can <laughs> so I can go 370. And that's, that was the whole thing is it's like the 370 is the next step. Cause I went 381. Um, I've gone 322, but now it's 370s, 330 is what we're going after right wow. now. <laughs> and, and also, you know, we, we brought up the cost before. How much is, I know, you know, we've interviewed a lot of different drivers, a lot of different teams, like in drag racing and your, in your lane of drag racing, is there, can you put a dollar amount to like what a 380, like a 380 car is compared to, you know, someone in the, you know, the top five? Mm -hmm. Is there, can you, is there a significant oh, yeah. amount of money? There is, there different? is because the parts attrition. So when you push it harder, you have to replace those parts more. Okay, so there's consumables that you were talking about. Yes, earlier. the consumables, the actual hard parts, the clutch discs, like everything you're putting changes. A lot more you're putting yes. a lot more wear on those yes. parts. Yes, yes. And so now, like, I've been down, up and down the racetrack. I now know how to drive the car. I know how to pilot the car. Now it's time to go faster. And so the cost to it does increase each weekend on the consumables mm -hmm. because now where i'm feeding in one or two pistons now i'm feeding in a whole rack say, yeah, a whole set. you know what i mean yep. so it, it that that's the hard part and that's the the part where you have to get overcome the the check paying part of the team ownership role is is tough it is <laughs> not fun when you have to pay those bills at the end of the weekend oh god yeah, it's, it's really like yeah, it's like write a blank check but <laughs> yeah I don't know. I don't, yeah. I, don't, I don't want to write the, the actual number. Exactly. And now that I'm pushing the envelope more, I am also pushing it to the point of blowing up more because I'm putting that much more compression on it. I'm putting that much more boost on it. I'm, we're moving the throwout bearing in the clutch that much faster and things tend to break when you start pushing the envelope. So on top of the consumables, chaos. You, it, it is total chaos. Um, on top of the consumables, it's actually the hard parts that I have to replace more as well. Is there anything you could do as a driver to be more competitive? Understanding, yes, you you know you're getting a new car. You you add more horsepower to the to the engine. Is there anything as a driver that will help you get to that next level as well, or is it really just the car? It's really the car. The driver comes in on those split second decisions. That's where the driver comes in and that is how you're going to make your name out here is how do you handle the pressure? How do you handle if you go out there and say it's first round Sunday morning of eliminations, you go out there at 200 feet, you smoke the tires. Are you going to make a decision to pedal the car? So you let off, let the car come down and then hit the gas again. Are you going to realize that something is actually broke and that's why you're going slow? And if you pedal it, you're going to blow it up more or that is what's going to make you a better driver. And so in order to become a better driver, you have to learn the parts and learn what is happening and watch the cars go down the track. And so every time I'm standing on the starting line, I am learning. I am learning of like, OK, so that's how that guy stages or however it may be. And okay, so now that I see the tire shake outside of the car, I know what the tire shake inside of the car is, and that was the damage that happened. So it's just more understanding of what could happen, and it's literally like the flight or fight skills. Yeah. <laughs> you have to decide what you're gonna do in that moment. With when, with the, I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> um, with the drag with with a top fuel car, right? When when you guys go out, what's the field look like? like how many cars are in the field? Uh, the last two years have they've been stout. So usually we get anywhere from fourteen to twenty eight cars for a sixteen car field, and twenty eight being at Indy, U.S. Nationals, granddaddy of them all, the biggest race of the year five qualifying sessions like normally we have three or four qualifying sessions this one's five uh memorial day weekend like or labor day weekend you know what i mean it's just like 
it's the granddaddy. It's literally our Daytona 500, our Indy 500. Like, it is the race to be at, but it's also the toughest race. Yeah, because everyone's, everyone's coming Everyone out. is They're there. They're for defenses. Uh-huh. Everyone is there. Uh, if you don't have your stuff together, don't go. It's going to be a it's waste. cutthroat. Yeah. yeah. So... I, I talk to people all the time also about, like, just in their class of racing. Are there, and there's always, like, some people that want to push the envelope to the point where it's, like, you always hear the saying, if you're not cheating, you're not racing, right? Or you're not, you're not winning. Are, what kind of cheating can you do? <laughs> <laughs> like, what is the secret? Uh, so I know, you know, back in the day, in motorcycle drag racing, people were, there was all sorts of crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. People were having, like, those... Um, cans of I don't even know what, the cans that you light for the the sternums. Uh huh. They had that in the airbox. Yeah, insane. You know, like insane weird stuff that you yes. like. What is going on? Yes. But like these are all you little can, tricks. Yeah. So you, what kind of you can fudge can you it? You could fudge it a little bit. You know, <laughs> <laughs> like um, I do not because one I do not have the budget to fudge anything. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, but say a crew chief. Uh, on a championship contender car, uh, they believe that, you know, the, the rack height needs to be completely different. We need to change the actual cylinder head and for the deck height and whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. um, you can do it to an extent, but NHRA has a good regulation and you can only like push the car so much. Right. I mean, you're already <laughs> at that horsepower level. <laughs> yeah. What kind yeah. of... It's not like, oh, we got this nitrous line ran yeah. underneath so you can't yeah. see it. Like, no. What are you really... That's that, why I, it's a, The biggest thing is between your clutch setup um, and how you apply the power down the track. And that's what you get the crew chiefs for. And that's what they get the money for. Yeah, like, they, they know, know they know how to do that. And so, like, my crew chief, Scott Graham, uh, he tunes Pat Dakin's car, which Spencer Massey drives, and he also tunes my car. And from my car to Pat's car, even though we have... Pretty much the same 500 cubic inch Hemi motor, uh, stage seven heads, you know, whatever it may be, our cars are totally different, completely different. Uh, just how, oh, the tune -up, uh, yeah, just the tune up and actually the actual chassis are different and that's gonna lead your tune up as well mm -hmm. is actually how much flex does the chassis have? You know, how much wing does it have? And you can adjust the wings and stuff like that to make sure it's more downforce or if it's lighter or whatever you wanna do, but there's things that you can experiment on, but you also have the mon have to have the money to experiment to make on these it. Changes. Yes. Okay. So not too much cheating going on. Yeah. So, <laughs> no fudging for me. <laughs> Krista, you have a nickname. The Greekette. Yeah. So how did that come about? Uh, so my grandpa's the Greek. That is what he's named for, because his last name's Karamasinus, and that's like a long ass name. A Greek name. <laughs> yeah, and he's actually uh, the first generation American okay. born here, um, and so they just started calling him the Greek, and that's been his name for 70 years, the Greek. And so when I started coming out, uh, Terry Youngblood, who is the wife of Kenny Youngblood, super famous uh, drag racing artist, she said, "You're the Greek yet?" I'm like, oh, "Okay, okay." done that, that's that, that is it that is how we got it the greek get <laughs> that's awesome it's good to hear how how people get their nicknames <laughs> remember i i don't know if you remember but i remember because I, I i we had this conversation you know my my instagram handle is frankie five mm -hmm. i don't know if you remember this conversation i don't think so and so the conversation was like so back then when it, we were into import drag racing there's a guy Vinny 10 and he ran 10 seconds mm. so i said well, I want to be Frankie five because I want to run five seconds. And you invited me and said, one day maybe you could ride in, in your car. And uh -huh. still holding you on to that one if you ever. I, whenever you are ready, sir, <laughs> we will put you in the car. <laughs> I just, I'm, the way that he, you're. He's supposed to do a burnout. Yeah, If you can burnout. get through the burnout process, then you can take it down the track. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so there's still hope. There's still there's hope. Still hope. One, day. one day, one day. Yeah. One day. So we're going to wrap it up. Thank you, Krista, for having us and yes, allowing us to use your booth <laughs> yes. and McLeod. This has actually turned into the McLeod Racing Eat Sleep Race podcast. podcast. Shout out to McLeod, by the way. Woo -woo. So we Thank really you. appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, Paulie. Paulie. <laughs>
Thank you uh, again. You can follow us on all our social media. It's Eat Sleep Race. We got Frankie Five. ESR. ESR. Hugo ESR. And Crystal Baldwin Racing. Make sure you follow us. Give us a like. <laughs> Share and follow Spotify, app, wherever you listen to your podcast. You can also watch it on YouTube. Later. Peace.